Hi. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to Poem Praise 2, and I certainly hope that peace and blessings have been and will be upon you this day. We are going to get right back into the lies my teacher told me. We're still in chapter one and we are on take 11 and it goes like this. Because herification prevents textbooks from showing Wilson's shortcomings, Textbooks are hard-pressed to explain the results of the 1920 election. James Cox, the Democratic candidate who was Wilson's would-be successor, was crushed by the nonentity Warren G. Harding, who never even campaigned. In the biggest landslide in the history of American presidential politics, Harding got almost 64% of the major party votes. The people were tied. Textbooks suggest and just wanted a return to normalcy. The possibilities that the electorate knew what it was doing in rejecting Wilson never occurs to our authors. It occurred to Helen Keller, however. She called Wilson the greatest individual disappointment the world has ever known. It isn't only high school history courses that he five Wilson. Those few textbooks that do discuss Wilson's racism and other shortcomings, such as Land of Promise, have to battle uphill. For they struggle against the archetypical Woodrow Wilson commemorate in so many history museums, public television, documentaries, and historical novels. For 25 years now, Michael Frisch has been conducting an experiment in social archetypes at the Uni State University of New York at Buffalo. He asked his first year college students for the first 10 names that you think of in American history before the Civil War. Hmm. When Frisch found that his students listed the same political and military figures year after year, replicating the privileged positions afforded them in high school textbooks, he added the provision, no, he added the proviso, excuse me, excluding presidents, generals, statesmen, etc. Frisch still gets a stable list, but one less predictable in the bias of history textbooks. Most years, Bessie Ross had led the list. Paul Revere usually comes in second. What is interesting about this choice is that Bessie Ross never did anything. Frisk notes that she played no role whatsoever in the actual creation of any actual first flag. Ross came to the prominence around 1876 when some of her descendants seeking to create a tourist attraction in Philadelphia largely invented the myth of the first flag. With justice, high school textbooks universally ignore Betsy Ross. Not one high school textbook lists her in the index. So how and why does her story get transmitted? Hmm. Frisk offers a hilarious explanation. If George Washington is the father of our country, then Betsy Ross is our blessed Virgin Mary. Frisk describes the, the pagans reenacted, or did we only imagine them, in our elementary school years. Washington, the God, 
calls on the humble seamstress Bessie Ross in her tiny home and asks her if she will make the nation's flag to his design. Hmm. And Betsy promptly brings forth from her lap the nation itself and the promise of freedom and natural rights for all mankind. I think Frisk is on to something, but maybe he is merely on something. Whether or not one buys his explanation, Betsy Ross ranking among the students surely proves the power of the social archetype. Archetype, excuse me. In the case of Woodrow Wilson, textbooks actually participate in creating the social archetype. Wilson is portrayed as good idealist for self-determination, not colonial intervention, foiled by an isolationist Senate and ahead of his time, we name institutions after him from the Woodrow Wilson Center at the Ronald Reagan Building in Washington, D.C., to Woodrow Wilson Junior High School in Decatur, Illinois, where I misspent my adolescence. If a fifth face were to be chiseled into Mount Rushmore, many Americans would propose that it should be Wilson's. Against such archetypical goddess, goodness, excuse me. Even the unusual forthright treatment of Wilson's racism in the land of promise cannot but fail to stick in the student's mind. Curators of history museums know that their visitors bring archetypes in with them. Such curators consciously design exhibits to confront these archetypes when they are inaccurate. Textbooks, authors, teachers, and movie makers. I have a picture for you right here. Did you see it? See it right there? And I'm going to read to you what it says right next to the picture. It reads as such. This statue of George Washington now in the Smithsonian Institution, exemplifies the manner in which textbooks would portray every American hero. Ten feet tall, blemish-free, with the body of a Greek god. Hmm. Now that I, I'm going to turn the page, we're going to pick up that sentence. Textbooks, authors, teachers, and movie makers would better fulfill their educational mission if they were also taught against inaccurate archetypes. Surely Woodrow Wilson does not need their flattering omissions after all. His progressive legislative accomplishment in just his first two years, including tariff reform and income tax, the Federal Reserve Act, and the Working Men's Compensation Act are almost unparalleled. Wilson's speeches on behalf of self-determination stirred the world, even if his actions did not live up to his words. Why do textbooks promote wartless stereotypes? Hmm? The author's omission and errors can hardly be accidental. The producers of the film strips, movies, and other educational materials on Helen Keller surely know she was a socialist. No one can read Keller's writings without becoming aware of her political and social philosophy. 
At least one textbook author, Thomas Bailey, senior author of the American pageant, clearly knew of the 1918 U.S. invasion of Russia. For he wrote in a different venue in 1973. American troops shot it out with Russia, armed forces on Russian soil, and two theaters, uh, theatrics, look like two threats, but I believe the word is spelled wrong is T-H-E-A-T-R-E-S. I do apologize when I said that incorrect, but let's keep it moving. From 1918 to 1920. Probably several other authors knew of it too. Wilson's racism is also well known to professional historians. Why don't they let the public in on these matters? Hmm. Herification itself supplies a first answer. Socialism is repugnant to most Americans. So are racism and colonial colonialism. Michael Kamen suggests that authors selectively omit blemishes to make certain historical figures sympathetic to as many people as possible. The textbook critic Nora Gabler testified that textbooks should present our nation's patriots in a way that will honor and respect them in her eyes. Admitting Keller's socialism and Wilson's racism would hardly do that. In the early 1920s, the American Legion said that the authors of textbooks are at fault in placing before immature pupils the blunders, foibles, and frailties of prominent heroes and patriots of our nation. The Legion would hardly be able to fault today's history textbooks on this count. Perhaps we can go for further. Excuse me. I began with Hella Keller because omitting the last 60 years of her life exemplifies a sort of culture-serving distortion that will be discussed later in this book. We teach Keller as an idea, not a real person to inspire our young people to emulate her. Keller becomes a mythic figure, the woman who overcame. But for what? There is no content. Just look what she accomplished. We're exhorted, yet we haven't a clue as to what that really was. Keller did not want to be frozen in childhood. She herself stressed that the meaning of her life lay in what she did once she overcame her disability. Certainly, she was not the first deaf, blind child on record as learning to speak. That honor goes perhaps to Ranghild Kata, a Norwegian girl whose achievement inspired Keller. Nor was she the first deaf-blind American to learn to read and write. That was Laura Bridgman who taught the manual alphabet to Ann Sullivan so Sullivan could teach it to Keller. In 1929, when she was nearing 50, Keller wrote a second volume of autobiography, Midstream, that described her social philosophy in some detail. She wrote about visiting mill towns, milling towns, and packing towns where workers were on strike. She intended that we learn of these experiences and of the conclusions to which they led her. Consistent with our American ideology of individualism, the truncantic version of Helen 
Keller's story sanitizes a hero, leaving only the virtues of self-help and hard work. Keller herself, while scarily opposing hard work, explicitly rejected this ideology. I had once believed that there were all masters of our fate, that we could mold our lives into any form we pleased. I had overcome deafness and blindness sufficiently to be happy, and I suppose that anyone could come out victorious if he threw himself valiantly into life's struggle. But as I went more and more about the country, I learned that I had spoken with assurance on a subject I knew little about. I forgot that I owned my success partly to the advantages of my birth and environment. Now, however, I learned that the power to rise in the world is not within the reach of everyone. Textbooks don't want to touch this idea. There are three great taboos in textbook publishing. An editor at one of the biggest houses told me sex, religion, and social class. While I had been able to guess the first two, the third one floored me. Sociologists know the importance of social class. After all, reviewing American history textbooks convinced me that the editor was right. However, the notion that opportunity might be unequal in America, that not everyone has the power to rise in the world is a is an anathema to textbook authors and to many teachers as well. Educators would much rather present Keller as a bland source of encouragement and inspiration to our young. If she can do it, you can do it. So they leave out her adult life and make her entire existence over into a vague up by the bootstraps operation. In the process, they make this passionate fighter for the poor into into something she never was in life. Boring. Woodrow Wilson gets similar, similarly whitewashed. Although some history textbooks disclose more than others about the seamy upside, underside of Wilson's presidency, all 18 books reviewed share a common tone. Respectful, patriotic, even adulatory, ironically. Wilson was wisely despised in the 1920s. Only after World War II did he become to be viewed kindly by policymakers and historians. Our post-war but partisan foreign policy, one of far-reaching interventions sheathed in humanitarian explanations was shaped decisively by the ideology and the international program during developed, excuse me, by the Wilson administration. According to Gordon Levin Jr., textbook authors are thus motivated to underplay or excuse Wilson's foreign interventions, many of which were counterproductive blunders as well as other unsatisfactory aspects of his administration. And on that note, I'm going to end Take 11 here on Poem Praise 2. 
please stay tuned because we're going to pick up on number 12 on my next take. I want to thank you for tuning in and I want you and your family to be blessed this day and certainly peace from me to you here on Poem Praise 2. All right. So until next time, I will holler at you later. So, later y'all.